What a great group we have this morning. I love when we get together as an entire group of first through eighth grade. It's so nice to see everyone together. And this morning I welcome our special guests, Dr. Anderson and Reggie Sharp, one of our first graders. And I welcome all the faculty, the staff, the students, parents, and friends of the Gross Point Academy this morning. We are pleased to be together this morning to celebrate the life and history of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And we get together every year, and you've been working in your classroom, I know, later today. You will be talking about Dr. King, and on Monday, we are not here in school, and who knows why. Celesta? It's Martin Luther King Day, and it's an observance of all of the wonderful things that he did during her, his life, and those are the things that we have been learning about in school and will celebrate today. Reggie Sharp, one of our first graders here in Mrs. Carly's class, is going to open the morning with a recitation of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. And last year he did this for our first through third graders in the lower school and their kindergarten buddies. And when Reggie was in kindergarten and he read the speech, and this morning he is going to recite it for you. And I think you will all be incredibly impressed. Reggie? state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day, down in Alabama, with this vicious race, with this governor having this lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day, right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls and sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day, every valley shall be exalted, every small mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith, we are able to view out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with a new meaning. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrims cry. From every mountainside, let freedom reign. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom reign from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom reign from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom reign from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. 
Let freedom lean from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom lean from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom lean from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom lean from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom lean from every hill and molehill of Mississippi, from every mountaintop. Let freedom lean. And when this happens, when we allow freedom to reign, when we let it rain from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Des Moines University. Dr. Anderson has held many positions in hospitals and businesses and was the president of the American Osteopathic Association and is currently a member of the AOA President's Advisory Council. Dr. Anderson is perhaps best known for his work in the civil rights movement. Dr. Anderson met Martin Luther King Jr. when he was a senior in high school. Anderson would listen to him practicing his preaching regularly. They maintained contact with each other for years. They even started a couple of projects at Morehouse College when Anderson was still living in Atlanta. Dr. King and Dr. Anderson started a youth chapter of the NAACP on the campus of Morehouse and became very active in the community. Dr. Anderson is currently the Vice President for Academic Affairs for Osteopathic Medical Education at the Detroit Medical Center, Sinai Grace, and Huron Valley Sinai Hospitals. He is also the Senior Advisor to the Dean at the Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Anderson. saying, I want you to come out to Gross Point Academy to speak to some of the students there. I said, where is that? <laughs> he said, the Gross Point Academy, that's in Gross Point. I said, well, I need better direction than that. So I got the address and put it into my GPS. All of you have GPSs now, don't you? <laughs> and you think it can take you where you want to go. <laughs> well, I think this one took me to St. Clair Shores. <laughs> it got where Gross Point Academy was, so it is. But anyway, let me share with you for a few moments, and incidentally, I was given a time frame of about 30 minutes with a few minutes for questions and answers, and uh, it's kind of difficult for a Baptist to stay within a time frame of 30 minutes. <laughs> And I am a Baptist, I'm very proud to say, my pastor, Charles G. Adams, I don't think he has a sermon that is as short as 30 minutes. I'm not a minister, but having been influenced by a number of ministers, I have a tendency sometimes to exceed all the bounds of a reasonable time. 
But I, there are a few things, though, that I want to share with you that I want you to remember. And this is going to be very difficult for some of you to follow. Because I am going to take you on a journey that started with my birth, December the 12th, 1927, in America's Georgia. Now, somebody's saying, oh my God, 1927? I did not know Columbus had discovered America by 1927. <laughs> well, it was a long, long time ago, so last year, I would ask you pretty soon, how old am I if I was born in December 1927? Yeah, yeah, you know, you, you, you. Now, I'll ask in a few minutes how old I am. But anyway, I, I, one, one year and a month later, actually, it was more like almost two years, but a year and a month later, Martin Luther King Jr. was born. I was born in America, Georgia. He was born in Atlanta, Georgia, about 150 miles apart. We didn't know each other then, of course. It was many years later when we got to know each other. But the fact that we were both born in Georgia, during the same era, America was not vastly different. 1927 to 1929. So although we were 150 miles away, we shared the same experiences growing up. We lived in a society where segregation and discrimination was the law. Put a pen there. Some years later, I went on to get my education in the America's public school system. He went on to get his education in the Atlanta public school system. And that became significant later in our lives. Because after I finished high school, I went to college in Fort Valley State College, which is in the middle of Georgia, and World War II was just underway. And being the patriarch that I was, I volunteered to leave a volunteer for the United States Navy. They said, well, the Navy and not the Army. I had seen some promotional videos about the Army where those troops were crawling around on their bellies and they were shooting machine gun bullets over their head. I said, no, 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 I don't want to crawl around with my belly and get shot at. I want to get a nice clean ship with nice clean sheets and a nice crisp white uniform. So I volunteered for the Navy. I stayed in the Navy for two years fighting for my country. Remember, I was born and reared in a city that you could define segregation and discrimination by that city, but at the same time, I was willing to volunteer and fight to preserve what we had in America. Because we felt it so, as bad as it may be, this was home. And later Martin Luther King Jr. would say, America is yet the best country in the world, and I believe that till today. When I got out of the Navy, I went back to college. Now I think I've been everywhere and I have done everything and I know everything. And some of you who were in service for a couple of years, you might feel the same way. I went back to college and finished college. And there on the campus of Fort Valley State College, there was a lady by the name of Norma Dixon. You're not going to remember her name. But I hope that you remember something about her because she is who is responsible for me being the person that I am today. Because when she saw me, she later described it to one of her friends like this. You see that boy walking across the campus like he owns this college? She says, yes. He ain't nothing. He ain't got nothing. He ain't gonna be nothing. But I'm gonna marry him and make something out of him. <laughs> Now, any of you boys, any of you men who think that you make decisions relative to who you marry and what you become, let me explain it to you. <laughs> I am a living witness, had it not been for her and her determination to make something out of me, I probably would be down in rural Georgia right now picking cotton and shaking peanuts. But how prophetic that this lady, Norma, Dixon would see me and decide, I'm going to marry that fool and make something out of it. Now, some of you lady might say, she was a brave woman. 
I've seen a man that I kind of like because he looks kind of cute, but I don't think I can make anything out of him. Well, she saw something in me that perhaps I didn't realize myself. Now, how prophetic. We went to her home in Atlanta, and it is coincidental that her brother was an aspiring preacher. Martin Luther King Jr. was an aspiring preacher. They were the best of friends in high school, at David T. Howard High School. If ever you go to Atlanta, look up David T. Howard High School. They would come to my mother-in-law's home and they would practice that preaching at nauseam. At one point I said to him, why don't you just shut up? Can you imagine? Future world leader, Nobel Peace Prize winner, PhD, outstanding preacher, and I'm telling him, why don't you just shut up? <laughs> that did not deter us from becoming good friends. We stayed friends to the time of his death. He went on to get his education at Morehouse College. I also attended Morehouse College. We did a few things on campus there. Then we went our separate ways. He went on to Crozier Theological Seminary with the Boston University, and I went on my to Moore University. I became a physician and he became a minister. Put a pin in that. How prophetic. Now I have met the man who would become Z. Martin Luther King Jr. and give that I have a dream speech. I met him long before, long before even he knew that he would become that world leader and Z. Martin Luther King Jr. Before I went off to medical school, I went to Marjorie Science School. I did not want any of you to go out of here now and say, that doctor came to talk to us and he had been a mortician. Don't tell anybody that because I don't do surgery anymore, but there are those who think that if he was a mortician, he might forget whether this is a dead or not alive that he's working on. So I'm, I, I want you to know that I put that aside, but when I finished my education, I was in Flint, Michigan, right up the street from here, and uh, I said, I don't want to go back down to old Georgia where I came from. I had enough of that segregation and discrimination stuff. I'm up here in Flint now. And I have a little bit of freedom that I did not enjoy down there. I don't want to go back there. But my wife, that same woman who said, I'm going to marry him, I'm going to make something out of him, she says, no, you're going back down to Georgia. No, I'm not. She said, yes, you are. No, I'm not. Well, now, there are some men here who are married, and they already know that when your wife says, you will, you may as well do it. Just go ahead and do it. <laughs> so my wife said, no, you're going back to Georgia because you made a commitment that if you ever got your education, you're going back home where they need you. They don't need you in Flint, Michigan. They need you in rural Georgia. How prophetic that I would return to rural Georgia because my wife said, you made that commitment. Put a pin in that. Go back. When I got out of the Navy, I started applying for medical school and could not get in right away, so I decided I'd go back and finish my college education. By this time now, I'm married, I have a child, and the second child is on the way. I did not have a job. Some of you understand what it means like to have a job, especially if you have a family. I had the opportunity, though, because I got that degree in mortuary science in Atlanta while I was waiting to get into medical school. I was offered a job in Montgomery, Alabama. Why would I go to Montgomery, Alabama? I was born in Rio in rural Georgia, and now I'm going to go to rural Alabama? But I was invited to go come to Montgomery, Alabama by a film director who said this to me. I want you to get your education. You can work here in the funeral home whenever you can, but get your college schedule first, then work when you can. What a magnificent opportunity to be able to go to school and work and take care of a family. Now, the prophetic part of that. I met Ralph David Abernathy, a name that I want you to get now. I did pass out a sheet that had some dates and some names of people, people and some events that perhaps you would like to remember some of them. Back in Montgomery, Alabama now, I'm going back to finish my college education and I have a job as a mortician, 
And who turns out to be one of my classmates? Ralph David Abernathy. Ralph David Abernathy, who later would become the right hand of Martin Luther King Jr. He did not know of his future, nor did I know of his future, and he did not know Martin Luther King Jr. Any, as well as I did. He had only heard of him as a preacher. Another coincidence. I joined Dexter Avenue Baptist Church while I was in Montgomery because there was a minister there by the name of Vernon Johns who was one of the outstanding preachers of his day. This is 1948. And later when I graduated from Alabama State College, now a university, a couple of years later, who is called there to be the pastor? Martin Luther King Jr. Get that. Both of us wound up in the same church in Montgomery, Alabama, both of us from different parts of Georgia. He did not know Abernathy, Abernathy did not know King, I did not know Abernathy, and knew King very little. But all of us wound up at one time or another in Montgomery, Alabama. They became good friends. Montgomery also became the focal point of the Montgomery bus boycott. All of you are familiar with that. You all have heard of Rosa Parks, who was the spark for the Montgomery Bus Boycott that was successful and went on for about over a year where the people decided, I'd rather walk than be discriminated against, be segregated in this manner. How prophetic now. Montgomery, Alabama became a focal point of the civil rights movement. And four of us who became intimately involved with the movement were in Montgomery. I was there. Abernathy was there, King was there, and Rosa Parks was there. Now, go back to when I went to medical school and finished, did my internship in Flint, and my wife made a decision for me that I was going to return to rural Georgia. I went back to Albany, Georgia to practice. Another name that perhaps you will run into at some time or another is that of C.B. King, Shabin King, not related to Martin Luther Jr., but he was a different King family, but he was an outstanding lawyer who had elected to practice also in the rural South. I was looking for a place to practice. Now I have my medical degree and I finished my internship and I got a license. I am somebody. But my wife said, you're going back time down to rural Georgia. And in talking to people as to whether or not this is the best place for me to practice, C.B. King, Shabin King said to me, all Benny will be as good to you as you are to it. I want you to remember that, kids. Wherever you come from, don't forget where you come from. And when you get your education, go to where they need you. Go to where they need you. And that place will be as good to you as you are on it. You never lose anything by giving up yourself. So I'm in Albany, Georgia now, and a civil rights movement started that I had not anticipated, I did not plan it, I was not the organizer. It was students, students like you almost. These were groups of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, primarily high school students, but also there were some elementary school students. And I had children that ranged in age all the way from 12 down to two months. Every one of them wanted to become involved in the civil rights movement, including my two-month-old. Well, she really didn't know it. She wanted it, but her brothers and sisters were telling her, you got to get involved in this. Well, the movement started in Albany that became the focal point of the civil rights movement. Remember, Montgomery was the first, and that was back in 1955. The second one was in Albany, Georgia, and that started in 1961. Civil rights activity was sweeping the nation. There were demonstrations all over the United States. You say, why was that even necessary? Didn't I read about Abraham Lincoln, who in 1863 signed the Emancipation Proclamation that legally ended slavery? Yes. It changed slavery legally but it did not change slavery in the hearts and the minds of people who were still living throughout that era. And for those of you who have not seen that movie, I recommend the movie Abraham Lincoln, go and see it. It is historically correct, and it is very, very worthwhile you see. The title of it is Lincoln. Make sure you get to see it. 
So here we were in Albany, Georgia, with the students now leading demonstrations, getting black people who had been historically excluded from having the privilege of voting. They were leading them to the polls to register and vote. For that, they were harassed, they were intimidated, they were threatened. From the comforts of my office, practicing, I had a great practice in Georgia, by the way. I had many, many patients who came to see me. But I went and joined those students. The students were the leaders of that civil rights movement in Albany, Georgia. And I went and joined them. Well, when I said to the people at a church meeting, come and follow me, where are we going? We're going to jail, what for? We're going to jail for our rights, what rights? For the voting rights, so we can have a right to vote. Are we going to get out of jail? No, I can't promise you that. Or do you have any bond money? No, we don't have any bond money. We don't have any lawyers. You want us to follow you off to jail with no promise of how long we're going to stay and how we're going to get out. I said, that's right. And they followed me. And they followed my wife. And when I had a few hundred people in jail, I said, oops, it's easier to get people motivated to go to jail than it is to get them out. I was not a professional civil rights activist, and therefore, I did not know what to do next, so. But, flashback, I remember Martin Luther King Jr., I met him when I met this woman who married me, and her brother was the best friend of Martin Luther King Jr. We became friends years ago, way back in the mid-1940s. I remember him, and now, and now he has had a successful number of us boycott, 1955, 1956. And then I also remembered Ralph David Abernathy. When I went to Montgomery to finish college in 1947 and 48, there was Ralph David Abernathy. These two people now were world leaders, and I was able to get on the phone and call them. Now, what does it say to you? It says, make friends at every opportunity. Make friends, everybody you meet. Make a friend. You never know when you will need, can use that friend that will be of help to you. So when I called Martin Luther King Jr., Rev. David Abernathy, oh yes, we remember you. You told me to shut up one time and say, yeah, that's me. But now I need you. And they came down to Albany because I needed help to get these people out of jail. I'm almost finished. Raise your hand when my time is up. Where is it? I, I'm getting on. All right. They came down to Albany, and somehow the word got out 100 miles around because we did not have the modern methods of communication. Many of these people had no newspapers, they had no radios, they had no televisions, they did not have electric lights, they did not have running water. But somehow the word got out. A king was coming to town. Martin Luther King Jr. was coming to town. They all had heard about the success of the Montgomery bus boycott. They all had heard about Rosa Parks, and she was the spark of that movement. They all had heard about Rap David Abernathy, but they had not seen them in person, had not seen even pictures of them, but they heard he was coming to town. They came to town, and that night, there were two churches. If you ever get the opportunity to go to Rural Church, and I recommend that also. It's pretty easy to get there now and pretty safe. Dr. Sharp is pretty, pretty safe to go down there now. And that's another story. But these two churches, Shiloh Baptist Church and Mount Zion Baptist Church, across the street, because you notice I said Baptist Church, Baptist Church. The only thing that black people own as an institution where people could gather together were in the churches. That was it, in the churches. There were no community centers, there were no auditoriums. The only place they could congregate was in the churches. So Martin Luther King Jr., with a few of his compadres, came down to Albany, and he said, I came there to give a speech. He spoke in one church, and as he was going to his seat, I said to him, you've got to go across the street. And he gave me all the reasons why he couldn't. He was tired, had too many engagements the next week, his calendar was full. But I'd say, these people have waited for 100 years. Put a pin in that, 100 years. Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1863. This is now 1961. Got that, 1863, this is 1961. And I'd say, these people have waited for 100 years. 
for somebody to come and show them how they can break out of this morass of segregation and discrimination. They had been taught in school that the only way you can change society is by having a war. And you know there are people in the world today who still have not gotten that message. The only way to sell your differences is by starting a war and kill over a few thousand people and perhaps but Martin Luther King Jr. said the only way to bring about the permanent social change is nonviolently, with peace, with prayer, with love. So here we were, hundreds of people in jail. They called me, just followed me out to jail because I said, let's go. And now I got Martin Luther King there speaking. And after they finish in one church, they go to the other church because they have that heard you. He dragged himself across the street. He was tired because he had a very heavy schedule. He took Graf David Abernathy with him and wife to walk and a number of others that you will hear about later on. But anyway, that night, he spoke in four churches full of people. I mean, full to capacity, overflowing. But on that night, I said, I knew another stride toward freedom was being made because the people in Albany were ready to bring about a change. And they were prepared to make whatever sacrifice was necessary in order to bring about that change. They were only waiting for somebody that part of the team to come along to show them how to do it with love, to do it in prayer, to do it in a peaceful mode. All that enjoyed it became a success, not so much in that the walls of segregation came tumbling down, no. But it was a success because the people in Albany, the white people realized the black people were sick and tired and they weren't going to take it anymore. They were not going to tolerate the system of segregation and discrimination anymore. And then the white people decided we had better do something. At least we better talk. But in defiance, what they did initially, that was close down all the public facilities. They closed down the bus station, the train station. They closed down the library, the swimming pools all of the public accommodations, but one by one, they were opened. That was 1962. There are two or three other events, and I will hush and get your questions. A lot of people were not happy with what Martin Luther King Jr. did because he disrupted their way of life. Many people were comfortable with the system of segregation and discrimination, and they did not want it to change. So when the change began to come about as a result of what happened in Montgomery, and what later happened in Albany, and what later happened in Selma, Alabama, and what happened in Birmingham, Alabama, we call it Birmingham, in Greenville, South Carolina, in Nashville, Tennessee, these events said to the world that there's going to be a change in America. This is the beginning of the end of segregation and discrimination as we had known since prior to 1863. You and I are witnessing that change today where the walls of segregation have been torn down so it is no longer the law. It is no longer legal to have segregation and discrimination. Our next step now is to change the hearts and change the minds, think, change the way people think about each other. So that we can do as Martin Luther King Jr. said on that day in 1963. Where is my speaker? When, when you know when that speech was, don't you, in Washington, D.C.? Well, that dream that he spoke of that day, we hope to be able to realize the fulfillment of that dream right here, right now, in this generation. There are two or three other people that I wanted to mention in passing. People that make me proud to have been in that generation that witnessed the change in society that brought us closer and closer together as brothers and sisters. With all the rights and privileges inherent to us being citizens of this country. People like Constance Motley, an outstanding lawyer who became a federal district court judge People like Damon Keyes, right here in the city of Detroit. And incidentally, those of you who have not met him, he'd be pleased to have you come down to visit him in his chambers. And there are people like Wyatt T. Walker, who was an outstanding minister and who was the chief lieutenant for Martin Luther King, Jr. 
these are people that we have a great debt of gratitude that we owe to them for the contribution they have made. I am privileged to have been a part of the civil rights movement and privileged to be able to share some of my experiences with you. And I'm going to stop there and entertain any questions you might have. Thank you very much.
in the years of 1961 and 1965, there were two major acts passed in Congress. Mind you, might think Congress can't get together on anything today, and that's about right today. But 1964 and 1965, two major acts, the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Prior to that time, blacks did not have the right to vote. There were no civil rights. Although 1954, there were. It was against the law to have integration in the school system. These things have been changed in the courts, and some of them have been changed by Congress. There was a question over here. Both up there, or in Canada right out. Why did you go to jail? Why did you go to jail? He, well, he wants to know why did I go to jail. Well, it didn't take much. It didn't take much for me to go to jail. All I had to do was walk down the street with a newspaper in my hand, and because I was the president of the Albany Movement, and by the way, I forgot to bring the books. Uh, Dr. Sharp, talk to Dr. Sharp here, because my wife and I wrote a book some years ago, and how many of you in here, about two or three hundred? You tell Dr. Sharp, all of you want one of those books. Yeah? <laughs> uh, make sure that you talk to him here. He will get you a copy of the book. I went to jail because I was in support of the students who were trying to get people registered to vote. And I say it didn't take much because the police chief would say, you will stop this march, you stop this demonstration, you stop this picketing, or you're going to jail. Well, we felt like what we were doing, we had a right to do. We had a right, there was a law, we had a right to peacefully protest. And we were peaceful in our protest. But that's all it took for them to arrest me. Just walk down the street. Um, but wasn't the um, Medicaid Commission proclamation time that there was a legal issue? That's right. The Emancipation Proclamation, and uh, that was 1863, was signed by Abraham Lincoln. But we went from that to what is called separate but equal. The next one was the following Emancipation Proclamation was the doctrine of separate but equal, which said, Blacks would have the same privileges as white. Never worked. Always separate, never equal. That's why it took another 50 years before we got around to it. This is not working. And then that's when we came up with the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, and the Brown versus Board of Education by the Integration School System. So it didn't work. Separate but equal did not work. That is not what America was supposed to be like. It's supposed to all be equal, have equal opportunity. Another question. Yes. Have what? Good sense of humor. Oh, good sense of humor. <laughs> yes, he, he liked a good humorous story. And he told a few humorous stories on occasion. And uh, he was an ordinary person. That is, a lot of people think that perhaps he was so aloof that he could not communicate with the people who may not have been at his same education level. I have some pictures, by the way, and I think a couple of them will be in the book, where he actually would have a good time in a pool room with the boys, if you would. The boys would hang out in the pool room. My office in Albany, by the way, was upstairs, and beneath my pool, right, beneath my office, was a pool hall. There are the pool halls around here now. And this is where the men who perhaps were, did not have a full-time job they needed some place to hang out. They would hang out in the pool room. And Martin would come to town, and he would be down there shooting pool. Although he, he with his PhD, and he's a theologian, and he's a writer, and, and probably one of the world's greatest speakers, but he also could identify with a common person, with a common man. He never put himself above other people. He could always communicate at that level. Did they think any less of him because of that? No. They thought more of him because of that. We had a candidate for the President of the United States that sort of wrote off 47% of the population. Now, they're not going for him anyway. Because they are, they just own the dole, they want to be on the dole, they've been on the dole, and so those are not the people that I'm looking for. He could not identify the people who were unemployed, not of their own cause. He could not identify those who had limited education, limited opportunities for employment. But anyway, Martin Luther King was not like that. He could identify with any class of people. That's why he was so admired and so respected. Another question? Yes. Did he have any siblings? 
Martin Luther King had one brother, his name, his name, I'll tell you in a minute. When you get to be my age, and let me see, you, what would you want to tell me my age? What did you, or you want to calculate my age, right? I'll ask you in just a minute. <laughs> but he had one brother and one sister. His sister is still living, by the way, and she recently retired. She was a professor at uh, Spelman University in Atlanta, Georgia. He had one sister and one brother. Harrison Martin Luther King Jr. had four children, uh, two boys and two girls. He had uh, a brother, I mean a, a son, Martin, who was the first son, then Dexter, the second son, and two daughters, uh, they, uh, Bernie and uh, Yolanda. Now, for those of you who have the opportunity to do it, let me let me tell this to the teachers and the principal. Each Thursday during the month of February at Michigan State University, I bring distinguished scholars, primarily African American, to the campus at Michigan State. There are not a lot of us who are active in the movement still alive today. Uh, how old you say I am? Who would who would calculate my age? Uh, how old am I? Eighty-five. She's right. Oh, great! Give her an eight, man. So. So uh, there are not a lot of, there are more people dead my age than alive here, so, so there are not a lot of us. But anyway, I want you to, I want you to know that uh, much of what questions that you have are included in the book that Dr. Sharp is going to get for you, and all of you who get to him, he'll get you a copy of that book. Now then, your, your question was... Did he do what? Did, did, did his brothers and sisters ever help him out? Oh, did his brothers and sisters? Mind you, his brothers and sisters were quite young. As a matter of fact, uh, Bernice, his youngest daughter, and my daughter, Darnita, were born the same month, and they are the same age, and they are about 50 now, about 50 now, as he had two, two sons and two daughters. And uh, both of the sons began to preach somewhat. One of the daughters, Yolanda, became an actress, and the other daughter, Bernice, became a preacher, a very good preacher. And uh, Martin's sister was an educator. And his brother died, and was also a preacher, but he died at an early age under mysterious circumstances. He drowned in the pool in his backyard. I'll think of his name <laughs> later on. Uh, your your question, then yours. Yeah. Um, did Martin Luther King have a favorite soup? Soup? No, soup. Oh, soup, yeah. It looks like he never changed suits because all of his suits were the same. <laughs> he had, all of his suits were like uh, blue serge, we call them. It was, a, it was a dark blue, white shirt. He didn't always wear striped tight, uh, tie. But he was a conservative presser. They almost was suit. Now, his favorite clothing store in the Purdy area was uh, Harry Harry Sullivan. Harry. Harry Suffren. Huh? Suffren. Harry Suffren. Oh, Suffren, right, Suffren. Harry, Harry Suffren. And uh, uh, there was a well known doctor in town by the name of Claude Young. Have you ever heard of Claude Young? Claude Young was the president of his organization for a number of years, and he died a year or so ago. But anyway, Claude Young said to Harry Suffren, or whoever was in charge of managing the store, whenever Martin Luther King and Reverend Abernathy come to town, give them a suit of clothes. <laughs> I called it, he said, look like they didn't have a one suit of clothes. <laughs> give them a suit of clothes. But although he dressed the same way all the time, he did have one to one suit. Yes. How many Martin Luther King events have I been to? Well, let me tell you, uh, uh, I left Albany, Georgia in 1963 and came here as a resident. I finished my residence in 1967. Every year up until the present time, I guess I have given on an average of four or five Martin Luther King events a year, sometimes as many as 10. But I'm getting old. 
You know that? So I'm not doing as many now as I have in previous years. I've done a lot of them. I, I lost count. Yes, in the yellow shirt. Um, how many years have you been doing the seminars at Michigan State? At Michigan State? Oh, this is the question. This is the 13th year. The 13th year, and this year, starting next month, uh, I have as speakers Don Sophia Abernathy. Now, Don Sophia Abernathy is a daughter of Ralph David Abernathy. By the way, every Thursday during the month of February, if you can bring a class up there, we'd love to have them. Those are the Abernathy. She has a magnificent, magnificent program that she puts on. I also have Vincent Harden. Vincent Harden is, uh, is a Mennonite. He's a writer, a lecturer, a theologian, a preacher, a historian. He's coming. Uh, the last I have is Jim, um, the original Freedom Rider. Uh, I have to think of his name. But anyway, those are the three for this year. In previous years, we've had uh, Dick Gregory, we've had uh, Joe Lowry, we've had uh, just everybody I could think of who were active in the movement over the past 13 years. But 13 years we have been doing it, and we'll continue to do it as long as I'm able. Up at the top. Oh, his favorite color? Blue Surge. <laughs> yes. How many did he give? You know, I never I never thought he went out of speech, if I can tell you that, because you never saw him read a speech. By the way, did you notice you've seen the videos of I Have a Dream? You did not see him reading that speech. One night, periodically, we would go on these whirlwind tours, and I went with him to see if I could keep up with him. We went to New York, and that one night, he gave seven different speeches in seven different churches in one night. I might have to say he, he was a prolific writer, but he also could speak, look like, incessantly without benefit of a note. As many years as I knew him, I never saw him read a speech. It all came from the heart. It all came from the heart. He was a very, very brilliant man. Over here, your question, before you go to sleep. Why did I move to Detroit? I can tell you this. If I would have gotten a residency in Georgia, I would not have left Georgia because I still love Georgia. Georgia on my mind, though. Um, Georgia did not have a black medical school. Okay. The two medical schools in Georgia did not accept blacks. So I could not get my training in Georgia. That's why I came to Detroit. I was invited up here to go to a residency at, at what was Art Center Hospital. So that's the reason I came to Detroit. Otherwise, I'd still be in Georgia. Uh, yes. So what was that? Uh, well, I guess sometimes you get kind of immune. You know there's danger out there, but you get to the point where you have no fear. My wife's grandmother at one point said to me, don't you know they can kill you for what you do? They have killed likes, but that's what you're doing. My response at the time was, if I am killed doing this, so be it. In other words, there are times when the cause is bigger than a life. And many of us felt as though the cause was bigger than a life. In the early days of the Freedom Riders, Diane Nash was one of the early Freedom Riders. And I will think of Jim's name pretty soon. But anyway, they were on the bus leaving Nashville going down to to Alabama, and Sagan Fowler was a Deputy Attorney General of the United States. Attorney General Kennedy, the brother of John Kennedy, said to Sagan Fowler, go down there and tell those kids not to get on that bus and go down to Alabama. They're waiting down there to kill them. The plan is down there waiting to kill them. Diane Nash turned to Sagan Fowler and said, Mr. Sagan Fowler, you see all these students who are getting on this bus 
Yeah. Last night, they all signed their last will and testament. Did they want to die? No. Were they willing to die for this? Yes. So there comes a time in your life that you figure there's something bigger, something greater, something better than my life. And Martin Luther King Jr. used to say, if you have not found something that you're willing to die for, you probably have not fit to live. I think my time is up. And on that note, that was wonderful. All right, thank you very much.